Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th Edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we're going to go over their history within the game, how they're utilized in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. In further celebration of the release of Baldur's Gate 3 and its vice grip on my soul, this week we're going to be going over D&D's primordial goddess of secrets, darkness, and loss, Shar, the Night Singer. First off, fair warning, this is going to be a very long video with a ton of lore, DM resources, and other things, and even then I'm probably only scratching the surface of Shar's actual in-depth explanation, so I highly recommend doing your own research in order to find the nooks and crannies that'll be very useful for your game. And, as one of my viewers has pointed out to me, it would be ideal for me to cover the goddess and Shar's twin sister Saloon, as well as Mistra, since the three of them are so deeply tied to one another lore-wise. There will also be massive spoilers for Baldur's Gate 3, which will be identified prior to explanation so you can skip past them at your leisure. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Shar's many titles included the aforementioned Night Singer, the Lady of Loss, the Mistress of Pain, the Dark Lady, and interestingly enough, the Goddess of Thieves. Her holy symbol is a black hole with a purple rim, her alignment is classified as neutral evil, her portfolio concerns darkness, loss, night, secrets, and forgetfulness, and her canon clerical domains are of death and trickery, but we'll add on to that later on. For the finer details of her godhood, her favored worshippers are miners and those who seek to forget some aspect of their lives, her favored animals are ravens and her crows, her favored monsters are nightshades and death tyrants, her holy weapon is a chakram, which I think is pretty awesome, and her favored colors are black, purple, and dark blue. Appearance-wise, Shar is known to have a variety of different forms due to her domain over darkness and illusion, but her most commonly encountered form is that of a beautiful woman with dark swirling hair, pale, almost ghost-like skin, and black eyes devoid of almost any light. She may be witnessed wearing either a black dress seemingly made of starless night, or some degree of light armor formed out of black metal and dark gemstones such as amethyst and sapphire. In regards to her lore, Shar's manifestation was believed to have occurred at the same time as the creation of realm space itself, being a personification of the void and nothingness that existed before existence itself was born. As such, many people believe that all of her acts and plans are all made with the singular goal of returning to the ancient calm of non-existence from whence it came. Standing against this is of course her twin sister Saloon, or Salone depending on the pronunciation, believed to be the manifestation of primordial creation and antithesis to Shar. Originally, the two goddesses actually got along pretty well, forming multiple balanced creations and even creating the first goddess Shanti together. However, Saloon decided to begin forming creations of her own without the input or presence of her sister, mostly those of light and warmth at the request of Shanti herself. It wasn't until that occurrence that Shar began to respond with such vicious reprisal, igniting their endless conflict and resulting in the creation of concepts such as magic, war, disease, murder, death, and so on, along with the corresponding gods to match them. The Lady of Loss's attachment to non-existence meant that she was intimately tied to the concepts of loss, as well as the delusion of hope and the constant attempts of mortals to fill their lives with purpose, all in the hopes of coping with the inherent emptiness and meaninglessness of existence. As such, Shar stood as a goddess of the pained and the wronged, feeling for the hateful, the jealous, and satisfying desires for vengeance and misfortune upon others. At the same time, however, Shar claimed to be a healer of sorts, allowing the grief-stricken to be free of their pain by forgetting their woes, which she then fed on and used to nurture spite, hatred, and zealous devotion amongst her followers. In terms of Shar's relationship with other gods and entities, her eternal enemy would always be her twin sister Saloon, whom she has been warring with since before even the other gods came into existence. In fact, the creation of many of the Forgotten Realms as other deities is believed to have been caused directly by the sister's conflict. Needless to say, they both constantly seek to undermine one another, thwarting each other's plots and battling through their mortal followers, servitor entities, and even engaging in combat directly, often with cosmologically disastrous results. They have, however, been recorded to have put their differences aside on occasion, such as when the Primordials battled the gods in an event known as the Dawn War, and some do believe that Shar's motivations for her actions against her sister stem from a deep-seated loneliness rather than hate, as her sister has grown to enjoy her own creations rather than the ones that she and Shar worked on together. Incidentally, there is a school of philosophy that is called the Dark Moon Heresy, where followers believe that Shar and Saloon were actually two facets of the same primordial goddess. This is a philosophy that is further reinforced by the Unchained Goddesses 5th edition supplement, which I highly recommend you guys check out and I've linked in the description, but whether or not this is actually true in your games is up to you, but I do think it has potential to be a very interesting concept. Besides her sister, other enemies of Shar include Mistra, the goddess of magic, who was actually created when both sisters assaulted one another with their primordial magic, mixing together for the goddess to become a sort of equilibrium between the two. 
The feuds between her and Shar primarily deal with Shar's attempts to usurp Mistress' domain of magic, as well as her act of creating the Shadow Weave, a dark mimicry of the normal weave that mortals drew power from in order to cast magic. Beyond that, Shar was almost cosmologically obligated to oppose the powers of light and the sun, which would include gods such as Lathander, Amatator, Shadankul, Paylor if you include him, and so on. On the other hand, Shar's circle of allies included the drow god of shadow magic, Veyrune, the goddess of poison, Talana, and Merkul, the god of the dead, who we've also covered in a recent video. There is also the implication that the god Mask may actually be a demigod son of Shar as well. In terms of Shar's abilities, the Night Singer was capable of manipulating all aspects of her portfolio, conjuring the deepest darkness and manipulating the memories of others. Sometimes this was done willingly by her faithful in service to her, while others were forcibly converted to her church via removal of knowledge of their previous lives. Shar was also credited with the creation of a plane known as the Shadowfell, a dark reflection of the material plane but coated in shadows and filled with life-sapping energy, which can kill those who reside within it for too long. Now, in terms of Shar's actual clergy and worship, the Church of Shar as a whole was an ancient organization made up of a number of different sects, having existed before many ancient empires and even many of the gods that are recognized today. Her members comprised of all manner of race and class, with everyone able to find some way to serve the Dark Lady's tenants and further her ambitions. And a very interesting aspect about the Church of Shar is that it was completely decentralized, with each sect operating freely and establishing their own hierarchy whilst remaining free to pursue their own specific ends. While this has led to a slight bloat, miscommunication, and mismanagement due to its size, the Church of Shar has gathered a massive following due to its focus on obtaining objective truth and shedding the frivolousness of life's distractions and falsities in the search of true purpose. The first of the Church's many suborders were the Dark Cloaks, a sect of the Church that served as oracles and caregivers to troubled souls and those who suffered from immense emotional pain such as grief or betrayal. What makes this group particularly interesting is that they were one of Shar's few morally good organizations, working to take on or soothe the pain through treatment, enchantment magic, or other means. The next is the Dark Army of the Night, a more militant arm of the church that had numbers reaching up to the 300s, while having a versatile collection of worshippers that included humans, half-drow, elves, and orcs, and consisting of clerics, rogues, sorcerers, wizards, monks, and fighters. Collectively, they were ruled by a powerful ranger death knight known as Vanric Moonstar, and I highly recommend checking them out in full as they're one of the few clerical organizations with a defined history and registry of villains for you guys to use in your games. Thirdly, the Order of the Dark Moon was a secretive monistic order dedicated to Shar, known for acting as shadowy agents, assassins, and enforcers for the goddess. They were able to keep their true identities completely hidden even amongst each other, and existed outside the church's traditional hierarchy. And lastly, and warning, this is going to be slight spoilers for Baldur's Gate 3, so if you don't want anything spoiled for you, please click the timestamp and continue the video from that point on. The Dark Justiciers, a highly esteemed order of Sharans who make an appearance in Baldur's Gate 3, are a secret society of divine champions who arise to become Justiciers upon killing a cleric, celestial, or a worshipper of Saloon in Shar's name. They were known to wear face masks, dark chain mail, and command powerful enchantment and necromantic magic. And in Baldur's Gate 3, Shadowheart can undergo the test to become a Dark Justicier, if she happens to kill a certain Selenite that you encounter over the course of the game. Now, with all this in mind, Shar and worship was often banned in most areas of the world due to its callous, nihilistic views and rampant cosmological disruptions, particularly with the Weave. As such, most Sharn worshippers kept their faith secret, disguising themselves as merchants and nomads whilst looking out for those who they could easily convert, namely those suffering from grief, wishing for vengeance, or disillusioned with life overall. In terms of rites and rituals that Sharns could practice, the two most well-known are those of the Nightfall and the Kiss of the Lady. The former was practiced every night by clerics of the Night Singer, during which they would conduct acts of wickedness in Shar's name and receive direct instructions from the goddess on their next goal. This was especially important on Nights of the New Moon, as that was often a Sharan's best time to act without any interference from Saloon. The Kiss of the Lady, on the other hand, was a much rarer and more brutal affair, requiring Sharan worshippers to conduct acts of sacrifice and brutality as a form of coming of age and rank within the goddess's clergy. Its occurrence could only be ordered by a high priest, so it was often an organized and celebratory affair. But beyond these two specific acts, Sharans were also known to suppress their own memories, both as an act of devotion and in order to protect the secrets of the church should they ever be captured. Now as for the canon artifacts that have been aligned with Shar and Forgotten Realms history, here are a couple of suggestions based on what I've been able to find. The Knight's Gift can be great for rogues or rangers, the Shadowstone can make for an excellent plot point or MacGuffin, and the Shadow Staff of Gorath here can be useful for casters and monks alike, while the Starry Gnosis can give your campaign's villain a much stronger level of mental domination, almost to the levels of an Aboleth. 
Then there's also the Rod of Oblivion, which was a magical stave that was once wielded by Shar herself during an ancient battle with Saloon in the city of Waterdeep. Its handle was completely made out of gold, and its head was made out of a fist-sized emerald and thrice cut. It was capable of inflicting amnesia upon those who touched it, as well as conjuring both lightning and tendrils formed out of darkness. Beyond those canonical powers, those are the only ones that I've been able to find about the rod, but it is currently believed to sit guarded in a temple to Saloon, which could make it an ideal target for your players to steal on a religious heist. Now, when it comes to playing Shar at the table, there are several different approaches that you can take, as it is with pretty much all the gods. You can lean into the classic good versus evil, creation versus destruction angle, which is often the easiest to implement, especially if you're running a purely heroic fantasy game with clear good guys and clear bad guys. In this respect, Char would be the spiteful, angry, vengeful goddess that most people believe her to be, focusing on breaking people's minds, feeding off their grief, and turning them towards her devotion and worship by whittling them down over time. You can also explore the angle of her being the jealous or otherwise hateful sister of Saloon, with her actions being motivated by either a wish for attention or genuine hatred. My inspirations for this interpretation of Shar would be Lilith from Diablo 4, Shadow Weaver from She-Ra and the Princess of Power, and Maleficent from Disney's Sleeping Beauty. On the other hand, my preferred betrayal of Shar, and the one that I usually like to recommend to others, is that of the conniving outsider and the pure personification of hopelessness and the void in people's hearts. This Shar doesn't care about cultivating worshippers or drinking the essence of loss and negative emotion, mainly because she doesn't need to. People will do bad things and hurt others all on their own, be it in the name of tyranny, higher purpose, or personal gratification. As a primordial goddess, Shar innately feeds off of all the negativity in the world, so her actions against her sister are not just volatile tantrums like some may view them to be. But rather, Shar is genuinely upset that her sister would rather cultivate her own creations and disregard their mutual efforts. Shar and Saloon did have a peaceful, collaborative relationship at one point, pooling their powers to create the goddess Shanti and the goddess Mistra as well, albeit accidentally. It wasn't until Saloon began to rampantly create things without Shar's input that she got upset. And so Shar has developed a deep-seated loneliness and resentment for the things that her sister has made on her own. The universe was supposed to be something for them to build together, and now Saloon has set a precedent that existence is no longer a collaborative effort, but one of struggle, power, and the eternal war of light and darkness. My primary inspirations for this interpretation of Shar would be Eris from Sinbad, the Daedric Prince Nocturnal from the Elder Scrolls, and of course, the Outsider from the Dishonored series, one of my favorite characters of all time. Now for our viewers who are looking to create a Shar aligned character but aren't looking to automatically take up the spot of Cleric, here are a couple ideas to make your class and subclass match the tenets of the Dark Lady. For artificers, you can have an armorer whose plate is made entirely out of night steel, which is a material that could only emerge from the Shadowfell itself. For barbarians, zealots of Shar can wade into battle with her dark essence protecting them from death, while those of the wild magic persuasion can call upon direct lineage to the Dark Lady, wielding surges flavored to originate from night and the Shadowfell as they rage. For bards, the College of Lore Bard could venture to collect secrets for the goddess, while the College of Whispers can wield her eldritch charisma and unsettling presence through both song and blade. Shar is called the Night Singer for a reason, after all. For clerics, while Shar is canonically known to have both the death and trickery domains under her belt, I would also like to add the Arcana, Twilight, and Grave domains as well. Arcana can reflect her creation and use of the Shadow Weave, while also trying to undermine and take Mistra's domain, and the Twilight Domain's philosophy on the unknown nature of darkness fits with Shar very well. The Grave Domain is excellent for sussing out undead to command and controlling the veil of life and death in order to kill her enemies and protect her faithful. For druids, the Circle of Dreams is great if you flavor the use of dreams, pathways, and magic as your character channeling the void that Shark controls, and the Circle of Spores' philosophy of extant life, decay, and returning to nothing can be very interesting to explore as a worshipper of Shar. For fighters, a Shadow Weave-wielding Eldritch Knight, a Void-flavored Echo Knight, or a stealthy Shadow-aligned Arcane Archer can all make for great character concepts, even more so if you lift the Eldritch Knight's spell selection restriction from just picking Abjuration and Evocation spells. A fighter that can cast Shadow Blade can be a very interesting and deadly combination. For monks, those who follow the ways of the Shadow and the Long Death can both work to climb up the ranks within the Order of the Dark Moon, and the Way of Mercy can work to heal their allies while bringing harm to Shar's enemies. For paladins, many of these subclasses fit within Shar's tenets, depending on the context of their oath, such as an Oath of Vengeance paladin seeking to satisfy their need for revenge, an Oath of Ancients paladin seeking to channel the powers of primordial darkness, or Devotion paladins pledging themselves in full to the Dark Lady. And of course, you can have your Oath Breakers who break their promises upon being shown the dark truth of Shar and worship, keen to cast off their false idols in favor of serving a better master. 
For rangers, monster slayers can be masters of hunting down Selunite casters due to their penchant for fighting magic, while horizon walkers can trek across the void itself, and gloomstalkers can be great for their focus on darkness and ambushing. For rogues, almost all the subclasses can fit very well with shard worshippers, given their focus on subtlety and secrecy. My favorites, however, happen to be the phantom, assassin, and arcane trickster rogues, capable of using illusory magic and wielding chakrams with deadly finesse. For sorcerers, those of the Shadow Sorcery and Divine Soul bloodline can retain Char's floating mist-like hair, porcelain skin, black eyes, as well as beautiful black feathered wings or a void hound companion for the former's Hound of Ill Omen. You could also explore the New Moon aspect of the Lunar Sorcerer, but that might be a bit restricting if you don't end up liking the additional spells that the New Moon gives you. For Warlocks, Fiends, Dark Flavored Celestials, Undead, and Great Old Ones are all very excellent avenues to explore Shar's power, allowing the DM to create some cool patrons who serve her in distributing these powers to mortals. And then there's also the idea of a Chakram-wielding Hexblade. And lastly, Wizards of the Enchantment, Illusion, and Necromancy schools all make for excellent devotees to Shar, and I can even see those of the Graviturgy school making use of her primordial cosmic void powers in her name. Now for Dungeon Masters, when it comes to creating NPCs and quest hooks along with Shar, they would both mostly deal with battling both Mistra and Saloon, wrestling control over the Weave, or growing the influence of her own Shadow Weave as well as her clerical following. NPC-wise, members of her clergy will seek out those who are suffering from grief, wrath, envy, or any other sort of negative emotion, and they may seek to cultivate it further, manipulate it towards their own ends, or consume it so that energy can be put to better purposes and their victim may forget. As such, Shar and NPCs are zealous but subtle, unflinching in their beliefs, but also careful not to alienate others through harsh conversion or by claiming that their views are utterly wrong. The party will most likely not even know an NPC is a Shar worshipper until long after they've gained their trust and helped them with numerous deeds, insisting that their faith only requires honesty and a willingness to look beyond shallow purposes such as noble status or monetary gain. Ironically, Sharans would probably be the most honest people your party will ever meet, although one could argue that omission and secret keeping is a form of deceit, but that varies from person to person. As exemplified by the Dark Cloak faction of the church, there can be Sharans of both good and evil alignments, but a semblance of neutrality must be present in either, be they more lawful and willing to work within the confines of a system, or chaotic and willing to speak out against tyranny and dictatorship. Shar's domains of loss, forgetting, and darkness can also have a very literal interpretation. Perhaps an NPC or even a PC has had their memories willingly suppressed in order to forget something that happened to them or in the hopes of leaving behind a terrible dark past in order to live a new life. Shar's creation of the Shadowfell also means that creatures who originate from it will have a strong allyship with her, such as the Shatterkai Elms, Darklings, Miazels, Vampires, Krynth, and sentient undead such as Bodax, Death Tyrants, Nightwalkers, and Shadow Dragons. As for quests, Shar would focus on depowering saloon influence through either subterfuge or violence depending on your DM or your player's approach, and she would also seek to topple false idols, preserve the forgotten sanctums and forbidden areas of the world, and uncover the secrets that would ruin her enemies. She may even ask to either remove or unlock the memories of others, which would require the talents of an enchantment wizard, or maybe even a psionic subclass such as a soul knife rogue, aberrant mind sorcerer, and so on. And for the end of these quests, or the taking down of Shar and worshippers, here's a list of items that I find fit the aesthetic and purposes of Shar the most. These can be found in ancient temples or ruins dedicated to her, granted as loot taken off Shar and enemies, or as rewards given to the party for a job well done. Anything that focuses on darkness, shadows, mind manipulation, and has the aesthetic of black or purple gemstones and silvery or black metal can work, so just keep that in mind when you're developing the look and lore of your items. And finally, for our homebrew magic item this evening, we have the Edge of Night, a plus two scimitar that requires attunement by a devout worshipper of Shar. While attuned to this weapon, the wielder gains the use of the Warlock's Devil Sight Eldritch Invocation, as well as advantage on all attack rolls made while in dim light or darkness, even if the enemy can also see them. Additionally, this weapon also allows the wielder to be able to cast the spell Maddening Darkness once per day, but at the cost of losing a memory that is precious to them in sacrifice. I can also recommend this to take a mechanical form as a permanent minus one penalty to their wisdom score, but that's really up to you how far you want to go with it. While I know that Maddening Darkness is a particularly powerful spell, I do believe that the sacrifice of cannibalizing your own memories is an ideal way to have a person balance out how or when they use it, which is also aligned with Shar's aspects of loss and forgetfulness. I've included the item stop block in the description below. And with that, that's Char the Night Singer, everybody. I want to thank all of you guys for taking a break from Baldur's Gate 3 to watch. And if you guys enjoyed the video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and press the little bell icon to be notified of future videos. 
Since we'll be covering Saloon and Mistra in the next videos to come, I will be putting down different other polls to see if there's other aspects of the channel that we can change. But DMs, let me know how you have used Shar in your games, and players, please tell me about your PCs who have worshipped Shar or how you've encountered her in your games. And also, let me know what you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.